Welcome. This is You and Your Pets. I'm Jim Horton, and I'm here with our resident expert, Dr. Ernest Rogers of the Maplewood Animal Hospital. And we deal with a wide variety of issues on pets, cats, dogs, and other pets on this show. This night, we have a returning guest, and would you introduce our returning, our returning guest, Dr. Rogers? Sure, thank you very much. Um, this is Dr. Jonathan Goodwin of the Garden State Veterinary Specialist. He is a veterinarian, first of all and he has done specialized education in cardiology and in keeping with our series this year, this year we will be talking about prevention and identification of issues and so Dr. Goodwin is here kindly to uh, discuss this different aspect of cardiology. Absolutely. Okay, can you <coughs> describe for us what preventative cardiology <coughs> is? Sure. Um, preventive cardiology would be mostly revolving around just general checks with your veterinarian so your vet can listen for and help you be more astute to any types of changes that may be going on with your animal caused from heart disease. So things like coughing, maybe a, a heart related problem or things like slowing down that a lot of people attribute just to old age can be problems that are arising from heart disease. Okay. What are the lifestyle issues of significance in dogs and cats, the exercise, breed predilections, obesity diet, that sort of thing? Um, dogs and cats tend to have two different types of heart disease in general, if you're going big picture. Big picture, dogs tend to develop more valvular heart disease. The valves are the, the tissue that actually sit in between the heart muscle chambers, dividing the chambers up, where the cats actually tend to develop more like people, actual true heart muscle disease. So, um, and, and people can also develop valve disease as well. Um, with the dogs, they tend to show more signs, coughing, slowing down with their heart disease than the cats. A lot of times the cats don't show you a lot of signs until something catastrophic can happen. Okay, at what age should you start heart monitoring? Um, again, most veterinarians as they do every exam, they'll listen in on these, on these animals and kind of listen for any types of heart problems. So they can happen at any time. There are animals that have birth defects, but if your animal never had a birth defect and you're a dog, then you especially want to start li listening maybe around the age of six or older. If you're uh, a cat, then you just want to listen continuously because they tend to develop most of their disease between the ages of two and ten, most frequently between three and eight. And I think we find, at least as a general practitioner, I tend to find the ones that most trouble me, the very young and the older. The ones in the middle, if you haven't found anything when they're young, often you don't see anything, but we monitor it every time they come in. So the older ones as they deteriorate, and the younger ones can be born, as Dr. Goodwin said, with heart defects. And those are the ones you find that are very troubling because you know they're ahead for a lifelong treatment, often very expensive for the owner. Okay. Can other organs or non-cardiac disease affect the heart? And we're talking here about kidney disease, cancer, heartworm, mm -hmm. dental Thyroid. disease. There are, there are a number of those diseases that actually can affect the heart. Um, like Dr. Rogers was saying, thyroid in older animals very, very frequently will cause issues in terms of them actually having a their heart start to overwork and the heart can actually start to thicken and not work as efficiently or efficiently. Um, aside from that, cancer can definitely have effects on the heart. Aside from cancer, you can have uh, uh, diseases of your adrenal glands that can have effects on the heart. Diseases of the kidneys can cause effects of the heart. So many organs can actually, um, brain disease, lung disease, ocular disease, infections. Uh, infections, respiratory disease, and bladder disease, even those can actually have effects on the heart. Okay. Uh, can cardiovascular disease always be diagnosed before a critical event? I wish I could say yes. Um, not always. Not always. With dogs, frequently you have a better shot at picking up things early. Cats, because again their disease is more of a heart muscle disease, you're potentially talking about up to about 25% of cats that'll have heart disease, that can be catastrophic with no signs until the, the catastrophe happens. And I've actually seen at least two cats that had a sudden cardiac event. In other words, the owner went into the shower, came out, and the cat was dead. And I've, se I've seen one where the dog was jogging with the owner, and the dog, uh, Portuguese water dog, same as the president has, 
and it just keeled over dead and was dead before it got to the hospital before I could do anything. So cardiac events can happen at any time and because he's okay today doesn't mean he's going to be okay in a week. But we do the best we can and we monitor the signs. We look for certain things when your veterinarian asks to do a test. It's usually not because he's trying to make money, as the 2020 piece said, but because we're concerned about the health of your, of your patient, of your pet, and we want to find out what's going on. What signs should a pet owner be aware of in cardiac disease? Not, it, we obviously are around these animals all day long, every day, and uh, their behavior, we can generally tell something about their behavior may not be correct, right. but we may not have any idea what it is we should be worried about. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, one of the big things that you'll pick up on often would be coughing, um, sleeping more, um, especially with dogs, coughing, sleeping more, um, potentially a reluctance to go up the stairs, mm -hmm. sure, especially up. Absolutely. They can have difficulty breathing, um, not typically panting, but more efforted breathing. Mm -hmm. Where cats are a little bit um, more sinister with their disease, they often will do things like stop using the litter box, they'll hide more, they'll sleep more, they'll um, often... Um, just change their behavior patterns. Stop eating. Potentially. Mm -hmm. So what critical events in a pet's life should owners be concerned about uh, in increasing the risk of cardiac uh, disease? This is everything from what? Anesthesia, exercise in the heat, left in cars, that kind of thing. Right. Any of those things definitely could, could be a, a stress upon the animals. There are certain breeds that we tend to see a higher predilection to heart disease. Um, there's so many uh, boxers, Dobermans, um, Maltese, uh, Cavalier King Charles, Chihuahua. Poodles, Chihuahuas. You know, there there's so many of them that it's hard to make a concise list for them all. But again, it would be a situation where you really want to look out for these guys, and you want to establish a relationship with your vet after you get a certain breed, where you actually look up and read about that breed, see what things they might be a little bit more predisposed to. You know, I do see huskies, but you don't see a lot of huskies for cardiac disease. Mm -hmm. you know, yet and still, you'll see a lot of Dalmatians. You know, so there's, there's a lot of variation in there between that, and a lot of it is a breed-to-breed a -breed thing. And if you have a mixed breed, hopefully they got all the right mixes. And I think part of the issue is that it's not 100% true that every XYZ breed is going to have cardiac disease, even though... Others in that breed does, do have cardiac disease. And similarly, because your dog or your dog's breed or your cat's breed has not previously had heart disease or known heart disease for that breed doesn't mean that that, do that dog or cat can't get cardiac disease. So I think that's, when I see something that I'm not sure of, I send it to Dr. Goodwin. Because I've seen something that clicks into me that the system that's being affected is the heart and Dr. Goodwin's going to figure out if I can't specifically what with the heart. Okay. I've pretty much found uh, finished with my questions, so do you want to take over, Dr. Rogers? On sure. Sure. I just want to make one more point. Leaving a dog in the car is a good way to get a heart attack. Leaving a cat in a hot car is a good way to get a heart attack. And so if you have pets, do not leave your pets in hot cars. That's just unconscionable as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely, yeah. Heat stroke is definitely a, a killer, and I think it tends to happen more in the areas that are going through, go through cold spells and go through warm spells because we're just not used to always being watchful of that, but the car temperatures can heat up pretty fast, and the animals have a lot of trouble blowing off that extra heat to get them in a better spot. Right, and that stresses the cardiovascular system? Yes, tremendously. It'll uh, Potentially, it causes them to do a thing where as their body temperature rises, they're actually doing their best to kind of blow off by panting all this heat, but they can't get enough heat off because they don't have sweat glands all over their bodies like mm -hmm. we do. They usually just have them on their paw pads. So panting and paw pad sweating is about the extent of how they can get rid of this heat. So the owner that would leave water in the car with the animal really isn't doing the animal much of a favor? No, not at all, not at all. It can really set you up for some, some horrible, horrible uh, changes. Even, honestly, leaving an animal 
chained up outside on a hot day without any place to get shade or water. Exactly, especially your your breeds with the snub nose or shorter faces, like the bulldog type breeds. We unfortunately ever summer every summer we'll see heat stroke patients. Typically, animals that have a temperature of one hundred and two point five may come in at 109. Oh my. Um, and any, you're talking about anything over 106 can cause permanent brain damage. Mm. The, other, the other event that we see as general practitioners is the spay, the neuter, the um, lump removal. Mm -hmm. All these things challenge the heart. Anesthesia is not innocuous. However, our anesthetics today are much better than when I was a technician 25 years ago. And our anesthetics today are cardiac sparing. But we still have to deliver oxygen. We still have to, we challenge the heart by cutting into the patient enough bleeding and we can have a cardiac event. Um, some of the drugs that the animal could be on, we can have a cardiac event. So um, uh, uh, maybe Dr. Goodwin, if you want to chime in with the um, challenges of uh, anesthesia and surgery in, in, uh, in cardiac. Yeah, the, the, the most difficult part with anesthesia, at least with the cardiac patient is You'll, you can have potentially different cardiac diseases. There are diseases where your heart beats too slow. So there are diseases where your heart beats too fast. There are diseases where the heart pumps too much and doesn't rest enough, where there are diseases where the heart doesn't pump enough. So you need to be cognizant of which actual disease you have so you can actually choose the best anesthetic to go and help these animals through the procedure. When you're putting the animal under anesthesia, you're putting them in a situation where they're less apt to be able to handle changes and less apt to be able to respond to things that are going on. So we always have to be conscious as vets when we're doing the anesthesia. We often give them fluids at the same time and many of these animals may have trouble handling the extra fluid load you're giving them while they're under anesthesia. Right. And so the other issues that we worry about are untoward diseases, things that we don't know about, thrombi, emboli. These are things that can be in the intestines, I'm sorry, in the blood vessels that can break loose and cause problems. More of an older animal issue, I believe. Yeah, more, more cats than dogs. More cats than dogs, but that's still an issue. So I think people have to understand that any event in an animal's life with unbeknownst cardiac disease can be life-threatening and that's why it's so important that they see me and I refer them to Dr. Goodwin. Um, I think the bottom line here, maybe you want to summarize, is the heart is essential to life and we have four shock organs, the brain, the kidney, the heart and the lung. lung. And these are the things that we have to can be concerned about. So doing preventative medicine and looking at the heart and making sure that it works well is always good. A absolutely. I mean, you know, my, my bias as a cardiologist would always be to, to look to the heart, but um, like Dr. Rogers eloquently said, our, our big focus is just trying to make sure that as veterinarians we are screening these animals in terms of if you at least bring your dog in twice a year, they can at least be listened to and we can check to see if there's any issues that are arising rapidly. Okay, well, we have to take a break. We'll be right back. This is you and your pets. I'm Jim Horton with Dr. Ernest Rogers of the Maplewood Animal Hospital. We'll be right back. Television is a powerful and influential medium that allows different groups the opportunity to produce programming that directly affects their own communities. Public, educational, and government access channels ensure that all people, regardless of race, age, gender, disability, religion, or economic status, have access to local government information and the use of a public communication forum. Make sure everyone has a voice. Support your local PEG channels. Welcome back to You and Your Pets. I'm Jim Horton, and we're here with our resident expert, Dr. Ernest Rogers of the Maplewood Animal Hospital. And for this segment of the program, I'm going to ask Dr. Rogers take, to take over and to interview our guest. Would you please do that, Dr. Rogers? Thank you. So I, today, I just want to say that in honor of Dr. Goodwin being here, I actually brought my stethoscope <laughs> so that he doesn't think I just use a tube to listen to the cardiac uh, sounds of a dog and cat. Um, I think we're talking right here about uh, an issue 
that is near and dear to Dr. Goodwin's heart, but certainly should be of concern to most pet owners. And we're talking about the heart. And the heart is a, basically a functional bag pumping blood around the system. Dr. Goodwin, you work on dogs, you work on cats. And horses. And horses. Yes, so sir. we didn't want to leave our equine friends out. No, no, not at all. So your primary instrument for evaluating the heart as it is for me um, is the stethoscope. So when I see a patient, I listen to both sides of the chest, but tell me what you're actually doing. Again, we're talking about prevention. So what would you be doing with your stethoscope to, to assist in identifying or helping to um, assess the level of competence of the heart? Sure, what we often look for, um, a few things really, we look for Number one, what is the heart rate doing? Is the heart rate within normal bounds? If you have a, a dog, normal heart rates for dogs vary between 60 and 180. Now it's gonna be up closer to 180 when they're very excited, closer to 60 when they're resting or sleeping. So what we look for is if you have a dog that's very excited and you have a heart rate of 60, that's not appropriate. If you have a dog that's uh, you know, almost resting, looks like it wants to be asleep and the heart rate's 170, that's not appropriate. We look for appropriate heart rate for appropriate behavior. Um, we also listen for the sound of blood flow and the, the sounds of the actual heart. There, there tend to be two actual sounds you can easily audibly hear, but there are actually four heart sounds that we listen for. And typically in the dogs and cats, we should only hear those two. If we're hearing more heart sounds, that could suggest that either the heart muscle is stiffened or there's some amount of change going on with the circulatory system affecting us. We also listen for how we're hearing the blood flow. Typically, you don't really hear the blood flow. If there's an issue with the valve or there's an issue with an interference to how blood is trying to flow, you can actually get what they call a, a cardiac murmur. A cardiac murmur arises when you have turbulent blood flow. Turbulent blood flow is the same as you would see if you have a water hose and water is allowing to come out of the water hose and then you put your thumb over the end and it starts to spray. That change in sound is because of the turbulence that you've created. That same turbulence you can hear in the heart at certain times when okay. the flow is interrupted. So that, that's basically what we listen for when we have a stethoscope. Mm. We put to the chest of the dog or the cat, we listen to the left side and there are three places we listen and we listen on the right side and there's one place that we particularly listen to and I'm sure Dr. Goodwin, Dr. Goodwin's ears are much more attuned to all the sounds and I can listen and I can hear things but that's why we refer to Dr. Goodwin. So there are other, other um, instruments that you use but basically when you listen to the dog and you listen to the, to the heart or the cat and the heart you're, you're trying to, it's what we call auscult. Mm -hmm. or listen to the heart sounds, as Dr. Goodwin so eloquently put it. Uh, we also do similar things in horses, but in this case, this is an ultrasound that we're taking of the, of the horse because sometimes it's difficult to hear the heart in a horse. Correct, and, you know, and oftentimes, I mean, they're such powerful animals. As long as they're fairly lean, you can still hear, but um, we'll oftentimes use the ultrasound to kind of help us out and guide us. The ultrasound gives us a way to non-invasively take a look actually inside the heart and see how blood is flowing. We can use um, also the electrocardiogram to kind of give us an idea. The electrocardiogram or the ECG or the EKG, you hear it called. The only, some people make a big difference about the, the difference between them. The only difference is in Germany they spell cardio with a K and in England they spell cardio with a C. So it's the difference <laughs> between EKG and ECG. But, um, we use that also to assess the heart rate, the waveforms of the heart that can help us to see if there's any evidence of enlargement and then also the heart rhythm. So we use those in tandem. We also often use blood pressure and potentially even uh, chest radiographs or we call them thoracic radiographs to look and see if there are any changes in the lungs because when the heart starts to fail, we often see fluid back up in the lungs secondary to the heart not doing its job well. You said blood pressure. Mind yes, if I interrupt you just briefly? Absolutely. How do you take the blood pressure on a dog or a cat? Typically you lay them down on either their left side or their right side and you take their front leg that's up mm -hmm. and you have a little, they typically are pediatric cuffs mm 
Mm-hmm. You put it around their little leg, and then we have a little Doppler crystal where we can put it on the artery, and we can listen for that heartbeat or pulsation coming through the artery. And when you inflate the cuff enough, you won't hear it. And then when you release the pressure, the pressure at which you hear the sound come back is the blood pressure. And we, in, in, our, in my practice, whether it's anesthesia or just monitoring an animal, um, what we do is we take a cuff which automatically inflates itself and gives me a digital reading of the blood pressure which I can follow along with the EKG or the ECG and the um, respiration um, and the oxygen in the blood. So those three things I can get when I'm doing anesthesia and those are three of the issues that Dr. Uh, Goodwin would use. I just want to make one more point about the EKG, ECG and that is that this is actually measuring a function of the electrical activity of the heart and so when the electrical activity goes through the heart it gives us the different spikes and waves that's very characteristic whether it's a human a dog a cat whatever it is and so when these waves change what we're interpreting is the electrical activity of the heart it can change because the heart gets bigger as dr goodwin said the heart gets bigger and therefore the wave activity takes longer or shorter or goes a slightly different uh, route. So that, that's the EKG, and I think that's, that's really good. Obviously, chest x-rays, as Dr. Goodwin said. And so what would you do when you're looking at a chest x-ray? Um, what would you be concerned about, the size of the heart, uh, it's, the it's, major vessels? Because cardiology includes the study of the major vessels. True, yeah. We, we often, at least as cardiologists, we tend to use the x-rays more to assess the lungs. And like you're saying, the the major vessels, um, the, the arteries that are carrying blood into the, into the lungs, the veins that are returning blood back from the lungs, and use the x-rays more for that than the actual heart size. We'll use the ultrasound of the heart, or the echocardiogram, they call it, to actually evaluate uh, heart size and, and heart changes. That's why we refer again to Dr. Goodwin, uh, to cardiologists, because we don't have an echo. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if we'd be skilled enough as a general practitioner to use it and, and make any kind of interpretation. So there are different kinds of echocardiograms or echo, uh, sc- uh, what would you call it, echograms, um, mm-hmm. and one is uh, 3D. Correct. Yeah, they, they have a number of different types, and, and, and you're right, Doc. The, the, the kind of thing that gets a little bit difficult is that since there aren't very many cardiologists, there are a number of people that kind of get a hold of an ultrasound machine and they go around and <laughs> think they know something. Do, do echoes and they sometimes do people a little bit of a disservice mm-hmm. um, in terms of, you know, as veterinarians, we, we have to kind of always kind of check our ego a little bit and try to say, hey, yeah, can I do this? But hey, this guy over here might do that one little thing a little bit better. And so, you know, I, I wouldn't go to the podiatrist for a dermatologic issue, you know, that kind right. of thing. Right. But, but, um, that being all said, there are a number of different types of echo. They have an echo that they can actually put down your esophagus. They call transesophageal echo. That gives you a real close-up, beautiful picture. But the animal or the person has to be sedated for that. Um, what we typically do is what they call transthoracic, where we just kind of hold the probe against the chest, and we can actually get images like this to see what's going on. And we use uh, Doppler technology, the same thing that they use for tracking weather and storms mm-hmm. to follow the blood flow and see if there's any abnormal blood flow present. So we, when we talked about the EKG and how it can tell us about um, the travel of the electrical waves, and when the electrical waves don't travel <coughs> quite correctly, we can have something called an arrhythmia. Can you give us a right. quick definition of an arrhythmia? Sure, the heart has a normal pattern with which it likes to depolarize. It sends electrical signals through itself. And causing contraction. Exactly. And so the electrical signals typically start at the top of the heart and they, in a wave pattern, kind of come down through the heart. If you have an abnormal section of the heart that's beating out of turn, like someone just jumping up in class and speaking out when it's, they haven't raised their hand and gone through the proper cycles, you get what they call an arrhythmia. Certain breeds tend to be more predisposed, boxers, Dobermans, very, very highly overrepresented for this. And so if you want, you suspect this, but you're not sure, they have a way, or we have a way to do a kind of 24 hour, 48 hour, even 72 hour continuous electrocardiogram or ECG by putting on what they call a Holter monitor, 
wear like this and dog's picture. He, yeah, he, he's wearing that to kind of do a recording of all of his heartbeats so we can track him out for a prolonged period of time as opposed to just putting an ECG on him for 20 two minutes. minutes. Yeah. And so the halter monitor, as in this boxer, funny you should say boxer, is monitoring. There are leads on his chest and it's monitoring his EKG. Now you used to do open heart surgery. Maybe you didn't, but I think back in the golden old days they used to. Now we're more into interventional cardiology. We only have a couple of minutes left, mm -hmm. but interventional cardiology basically is non-invasive applications to the heart. Correct. That's that's typically how we do most of our procedures. Um, the, a lot of times people try to do open heart with dogs, and in general it hadn't been successful. They used to use dogs as a model for humans trying to do bypass, and they typically failed miserably, and so they almost abandon the human bypass pro projects so until they switch to sheep and pigs to kind of get a little bit more attuned with. But um, with the dogs, we typically do um, more interventional procedures where we either go through a vein in the neck or an artery in the neck or a vein or artery in one of the legs to get where we need to do in the heart and we use little catheters to reach those spots to do what we want to do. And so one of the interventional techniques, and if we could be brief because we have almost a minute left, is this, which is a pacemaker, as they use in humans, and often I think we get them from old ones, used ones from humans, and, and this is used for what we were talking about before, an arrhythmia. And what kind of arrhythmia would you use this for, and when would you put this in? Um, typically, we when, have about a minute. when the dogs have too slow of a heart rate, and they have a, what they call complete heart block, we can use it for that. We can use it for an arrhythmia called sick sinus syndrome. Um, or uh, the other one is potentially atrial standstill. Those are three arrhythmias that we know of that typically lead you to warrant having a heart that's too slow that needs to have a kind of a pick-me-up, and that's what the pacemaker acts as, a pick-me-up to kind of keep the heart going at a regular beat. And so um, I guess we only have, we have less than a minute left. So I just wanted to sum up what, what we've talked about. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in prevention of cardiac disease, I've suggested several things here, and, and please tell me if you agree. Regular every six month exams, sure. um, cardiac, regular cardiac exams as well, Sure. Um, heartworm preventative, Absolutely. appropriate diet for the age, mm -hmm. and regular blood tests and x-rays over five to six years for both cats and dogs. That'd be wonderful. Anything else? Um, just keep watching your animal. Love them, and if you see something you're not sure about, bring them into your vet, at least get them checked. And if anyone has any questions about any of this or any of the other programs, feel free to contact us at maplewoodah at comcast.net. And that'll be an email. We can't diagnose, but we'll answer. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Goodwin, and of course, Dr. Rogers. And this has been You and Your Pets. I'm Jim Horton. Thank you for watching.